Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! I've been a teacher for a decent chunk of years now and let me tell you, I've seen my fair share of entitled students and parents. But what happened over the past few days? Well, that ticks the cake. It's a story of justice, a bit of clever maneuvering by the school district and a lesson in responsibility that I doubt will be forgotten anytime soon. Sit tight, because this is a doozy. It all started on what seemed like a regular Tuesday. I was in the middle of explaining the intricacies of the Revolutionary War to my 8th grade history class when I noticed one of my students, let's call him Jake, was more interested in his iPhone 12 than in George Washington's military strategies. I've always had a policy about phones in class. They are a no-go unless we're using them for an educational app or activity. So naturally, I approached Jake and asked him to hand over the phone until the end of the class. Jake, who is the confidence of someone who's never been told no, decided that wasn't going to happen. Instead of handing it over, he yanked it out of my hand with such force that it went flying across the room, right into the window. The sound of breaking glass filled the room and all eyes were on a shattered window and Jake's now equally shattered iPhone on the floor. Fast forward a bit and the administration is involved. They are usually pretty lenient, hoping to resolve things without too much fuss, but Jake's parents, well, they were having none of it. They came storming in the next day demanding that I personally pay for Jake's phone. Their argument was that since it broke when I supposedly had it, I should be responsible. I tried to explain what really happened, but they kept insisting, you better pay for my son's phone. Now here is where it gets good. The school district, after reviewing the security footage, statements from witnesses, and the whole nine yards, decided they were going to stand up not just for me, but for the entire teaching staff. They acknowledged, technically, since the phone did get damaged in the melee, they cover the cost of the phone. Yes, they agreed to write a check for around $800 to replace Jake's iPhone 12. But oh, they didn't stop there. The administration backed by the district then sent Jake's parents a bill for the window. Their son's little stunt had not only disrupted the class, but now was going to disrupt their bank account to the tune of $1,678. It wasn't just any window, it was one of those specialized hard to replace ones that made the bill so steep. The rationale? Once I let go of the phone, it was in Jake's position, and thus, the window's destruction was on him. You should have seen the looks on their faces when they got the bell. It was a mixture of shock, disbelief, and realization that maybe, just maybe, their actions, and by extension their son's actions, had consequences. On top of the financial lesson, Jake was also given ISS in school suspension for the destruction of school property. The parents tried to argue, of course, they tried to spin it every which way to avoid taking responsibility, but the school stood firm, supported by the clear evidence and the testimony from the class. In the end, they had to pay for the window and Jake had to serve his suspension. This whole saga has been the talk of the staff room, it's not just about the satisfaction of seeing entitled behavior rightfully corrected, it's about a school district that decided to stand up for its teachers and enforce a lesson in accountability. As for Jake, I hope this experience teaches him something valuable about respect, responsibility, and the real-world consequences of his actions. And maybe his parents learned something too. Many moons ago, think early 2000s, I worked for a small tech company in the Midwest. I started out as a customer service rep. My husband also worked there in a higher level position in a different department. There was an office manager there who did not like me at all when I got hired. She originally was a billing rib and got moved to the office manager position when the original one who hired me quit. As an added note, her brother also worked there in the same department as my husband. I was pretty much a model employee, my stats were great, I was always on time and customer feedback surveys were always glowing when I was on shift. However, it seemed like she had it out for me because she was always trying to find something to nitpick about my performance. I divulged all this to my husband and he admitted that prior to us getting together, and before I was hired, she had expressed interest in dating him, but he rejected her. I complained to the owner, 
but he pretty much just shrugged it off because she had been there forever and he didn't want to rock the boat. Come performance review time and she gave me a terrible review and a tiny raise, along the lines of everyone else on the team getting 50 cents to a dollar per hour raise and she gave me a nickel. About 6 months later there was a big shake up in the company and the general manager and the two higher level people from my husband's department left to work at another company who did the same type of business. Shortly thereafter, a couple of big accounts my boss was pursuing ended up going to the other company, thinking that perhaps information about the accounts he was trying to land was leaked to another company. He sent a couple people home with pay for two days while he investigated, including the office manager who hated me. On day two, he met with the team and confirmed there was no leak, so he would be bringing the workers back in. Cue pity revenge. I had found the office manager's blog some time ago and she had been posting frequent updates since the shakeup. When she was sent home, she posted multiple updates about the situation, including how she figured the owner would screw up payroll, not pay taxes, and get in trouble with the IRS. She also posted some pretty derogatory things about the owner. She did make a feeble attempt to keep it anonymous by spelling everyone's names backwards and making up a fake name for the company, but it was very clear it was her and our company she was talking about. After the team meeting, I asked to meet with my boss alone and showed him all the posts. He dug in and found even more damning stuff she had written, including how she couldn't stand me and wanted to get me fired. I hadn't even seen that post until then. I couldn't contain my crab-eating grin when she returned to the office, only to be told to pack up her stuff and go. Within a year, I had a big bay pump and a promotion to management, and I assume she's off somewhere making people miserable. I was sipping my coffee, enjoying the early morning stillness in my small countryside property, when I heard the unmistakable sound of rustling and footsteps coming from the woods at the edge of my property. My initial thought was that it could be a lost hiker or perhaps a neighbor's dog, but what I saw left me dumbfounded. Emerging from the trees was a woman, who I were referred to as Karen for the sake of the story, and her son, who couldn't have been more than 10 years old. Both were dicked out in hunting gear, and Karen was carrying a rifle. Confused and concerned, I approached him, making sure to keep a safe distance. Excuse me, I called out. Can I help you? You do realize you're on a private property, right? Karen turned to me, her expression one of annoyance rather than a guilt or embarrassment I was expecting. Yeah, I know, she replied dismissively. But the hunting is good here, and my son wanted to try it out. Don't worry, we won't be long. I was taken aback by her braziness. I'm sorry, but that's not how it works. You can't just come onto someone's property without permission, especially not for hunting. It's dangerous and illegal. Her face turned to a scowl and she took a threatening step forward, leveling her rifle at me. Listen, we're not hunting anyone. Just go back to your house and leave us be, or else. My heart raised at the sight of the gun pointed in my direction. I raised my hands in a gesture of peace, and I said, there is no need for threats. I am going to go back to my house, but I am telling you now, I am calling the police. As I turned to leave, ensuring I kept an eye on her movements, Karen did something utterly insane. She started firing her rifle in my direction. I don't know if she was shooting at me or just trying to scare me, but I wasn't about to stick around to find out. I ducked and ran, zigzagging through the trees to make myself a harder target. Reaching my house, I slammed the door shut, locked it, and immediately called 911. My hands were shaking so much I could barely hold a phone. I reported what had happened and then, not knowing if Karen would come after me, I went to my safe and pulled out my shotgun but I didn't want to use it, but I had to protect myself. I took position where I could watch the approach to my house and my heart was pounding in my chest. Minutes stretched into what felt like hours as I waited, the dispatcher assuring me that officers were on their way. Then through the window I saw Karen again, moving cautiously toward my house, rifle still in hand. It was like something out of a nightmare, she was hunting me on my own property. The gravity of the situation hit me hard, I was possibly moments away from having to make a life-altering decision. Could I really defend myself if it came down to it? My thoughts were a whirlwind of fear and disbelief, but then salvation. 
The sound of sirens cut through the tension like a knife, growing louder as several police cars tore down the driveway. Officers, with their weapons drawn, poured out and immediately took control of the situation. Karen was arrested on a spot for trespassing, illegal hunting, and attempted murder. Her son, looking scared and confused, was taken into custody as well, to be picked up by his father or another relative from the station. In the aftermath, I was a mess of adrenaline and relief. The police took my statement, commending me for handling the situation as well as I could. In the end, Karen was sentenced to three years in prison for her actions. It was a sobering conclusion to an ordeal that had seemed so surreal. It's a story that until now I would have struggled to believe if I hadn't lived it myself, but it's something that reminds me that the world is more bizarre and dangerous than we'd like to admit. A long time ago I was waiting tables at lunch in a decent restaurant. We had iced tea that we brewed each morning and it was slightly orange flavored and this was on a menu as well as hot tea. For hot tea we had an assorted variety of celestial seasonings. A table of two women came in and one ordered iced tea but one of the celestial seasoning flavors. I explained that we only have one type of iced tea made and the others were listed under hot tea. I also explained to her that this is not something we are supposed to do and it messes us up because people expect free refills like it's the regular iced tea. She was not nice and was not happy that I would not go out of my way to make her what she wanted. We were reasonably busy and this was not something we were supposed to do. I don't know where the manager was or if I was new to waiting tables and did not think to get the manager to talk to them. In a fairly witchy tone, she said she would go around our rules by ordering the hot tea and a glass of ice and do it herself. I went to the wait station and filled a glass with iced tea and put it on the ice pan to chill. Got a mug of water and microwaved it to boiling. I then brought the mug, the tea bag, the glass of ice and a straw for her table. About five minutes later I was taking an order from another table and the two women were frantically waving me down. As I expected, the hot tea hit the cold glass, cracking the glass and dumping all the tea on the table. I tried to sound stupid when I said, maybe that's why we weren't supposed to do that. As I cleaned up the mess, she never did get to drink any tea. Let's introduce the cast of characters and hopefully make things clearer. There is me and my significant other. There is my cousin one, there significant other and there are two children ranging in age from seven to nine. There is my aunt and there is my other cousin two and cousin three and his own son who is 18. Cousin two and three are siblings. We are all 40 and over. All have jobs except for the kids, the 18 year old and the aunt who is retired. We've decided to plan a family reunion for four nights and five days. Cousin 2 paid $1,500 for the cabin and left the planning and buying of food to me and Cousin 1. Cousin 1 has not helped financially at all, but has left me and my significant other to buy the food, because I knew it would have fallen on us for several months now. We've been buying food little by little when we buy our groceries. We estimate we will spend close to $1,000 when it's all said and done. We aren't planning elaborate meals. But buying food for 10 people for 11 meals adds up. Cousin 2 is well aware Cousin 1 isn't helping with the food and that is just me and my significant other paying. Cousin 2 continually reminds me that we have an 18 year old man coming and he eats a lot and that we need to make sure we have enough for him. I explained I bought a package of 40 hamburger patties. Even if all 10 people eat two hamburgers a piece, there will be 20 hamburger patties left. I also said we're planning on 5 pounds of ground beef for spaghetti and another 5 pounds for chili. There will also be sides like rice or salad or cornbread or garlic bread. I've planned like that for every meal. Plus there will be bread and peanut butter and jelly and cereal. I can't imagine there won't be leftovers that he can eat if he gets hungry. He's still insisting that's not enough food and we should buy a couple of rotisserie chickens and Cousin 3 suggests we buy ramen for his 18 year old son. Cousin 3 and his son haven't not financially contributed even a penny towards this nor do they have plans to pay for anything. I flatly refuse to buy extra food and after 
the tense text. I finally told Cousin 2 that since Cousin 3 and his son were getting a free vacation, if the food provided isn't enough, then he can starve. I might have also called the moochers to have the gal to suggest foods that I could buy for them. Update number 1. Short recap, we're going to a cabin in the woods for vacation, it's a family trip with extended family, several cousins, a couple of kids, an aunt and a significant other. One cousin pays for the cabin and left the planning and buying meals to me and another cousin. The other cousin has not helped buy anything, literally nothing. We're talking probably close to 1k of food pots and he hasn't paid not one penny. Won't Venmo me money, won't buy stuff on his own. Constant excuses. Last night he messaged me and the cousin that paid for the cabin and said he wanted to invite more people. The cousin that paid for the cabin said no, was actually polite about it, I've seen the texts. And the one who hasn't contributed a dime is now flipping now because he was told no. I'm just unfounded at this point. I don't have a lot of family left. That's why I was biting my tongue about the ones not paying towards this trip, but I'm just shocked that someone who hasn't contributed a dime to a trip thinks they can invite four other people and gets upset when told no. Update number two. I was asked to give an update and I've gotten a decent following, so here is your update. Our weekend is almost over, the last of the family leaves tomorrow, so I figured now would be a great time to give you guys the update. Well, a cousin that wanted to bring extra people did not bring them, and he actually bought groceries. There was a group list going, and he stopped before he got to the cabin and bought everything that was on a list that hadn't been bought yet. And two days later, we had to make a grocery run for more food. Several people had the munchies, and that was a decent bill, and he paid that. He also helped with the cooking and cleaning, so in my eyes, he pulled his own weight. The cousin that brought his brother and nephew, they spent the entire time high and drunk, but they weren't annoying. So while I personally don't see the point of what they did, I'm not going to complain. Plus, we'd wake up in the morning and he always made something like cookies or prepped food for the day. And he was great at emptying and refilling the dishwasher. Only one kick came. We had a blast with Sick Kid. My significant other had fun as well. For me, I was pleasantly surprised. I had a great time and it was really neat to see my aunt and my cousins. From mannerisms, to facial features, to the one cousin who is covered in fur from head to toe, it's been hard on me since my dad died and for a reason that would fill a book, I didn't grow up with this side of the family. So I had a great time reconnecting with them. We had a family meeting where we came up with a budget and how much each person needed to contribute to keep this thing going. Plan is to do the same next year. I'm supposed to call tomorrow to see about reserving the cabin for next year. Date number three. As I said, we are trying to make this a yearly tradition. We've gotten together the last two years and no one has killed someone, so we're trying for a third time. On a cruise ship this time, ominous music plays. The place we stayed at the last two times doesn't have any openings for the next two years, so, after trying Airbnbs that charge a heck of a lot for a place big enough for us, I finally say screw it, we're looking at cruises. And wouldn't you know, there is a fairly cheap one that aligns with the dates we can go. Somehow it all fell on me to organize it. And it's like herding cats. I need specific information from each person going and we're up to 10 people. And group emails and texts go unanswered so... I have to individually harass each person to get very basic info like birth dates, full names and email addresses. Finally gave an ultimatum that worked. Give me your info today or you're not going. And finally, miraculously I got everyone's info. I am so impressed with myself I am going to reward myself with a nice margarita tonight. Or maybe something stronger. We've divided the cabins up basically by households. Uh, if you live with someone or are a direct family member, such as a child of someone, you'll be assigned to the same cabin. And this is the part you guys are waiting for. The entitled person aspect to this. And why I decided to give this update. I chose the cheapest cabins for all but one cabin. The more expensive cabin will entirely be paid for by the people occupying it. One of the cheap cabins may not get to go. No one else is footing the bell. Those two people occupying it are responsible for their portion. If they can't pay, they don't go. And no one else is penalized. They know this. They have 10 months to come up with the price of their cabin. It'll be a struggle, 
The struggle is entirely due to poor financial management. One of the persons in the cabin who may not get to go is asking to switch roommates and cabins with a more expensive cabin. The same person that did not contribute anything to the last reunion. Not even cleaning up, cooking, organizing, nada. And they think they are going to weasel their way into a free cruise. Not gonna happen. Edit. I'll keep giving updates as long as people want to hear about my crazy family. I imagine I won't have another update until the final payment is due, and that is not until August. Date number 4. I have a surprising amount of followers and I promised to update once the cruise had to be paid for and so here we are. It's going to be a short update because we haven't gone on the cruise yet. Once we get back from the cruise I'll update again. And yes, I read the criticism about using numbers rather than fake names. So I'll just be vaguer and not mention numbers. It was a miss getting all the information needed to book the cabins but we did. The entitled aunt tried to switch rooms with someone else who has a suite while only paying the inside cabin rate. That was shut down immediately. One cabin fell through so those two will not be joining us. There was a breakup and then the other person couldn't afford to pay for the cruise. Everyone else is paid for and everyone paid for their own cabin. It did come down to literally the last moment. I expected the entitled aunt to have to drop out but she somehow found the money. All but one cabin has bought the drink package. The cabin that can't afford to buy the drink package thinks they can buy wine. Pour it out and fill it with something stronger. We shall see if that is smuggled on board. Feel free to take bets on that. Another cabin wants to smuggle bot on board even though they are well aware of the drug dogs at the port. That cabin plans to vacuum seal it. Feel free to take bets on. If that cabin gets caught, my cabin will get on that ship, whether the others do or not. And I plan to spend the majority of the cruise drunk of the others to actually make it on board. Thinking of getting everyone 80 cups or maybe a tote bag with some sort of phrase to commemorate this year's family vacation. Take number 5. You know that phrase, you're a glutton for punishment? Well, yeah, that's me. <laughs> so, one thing I purposely Failed to mention in my other post is that I have another vacation plans for my significant other and I, right before we go on this cruise. As we come home we have about enough time to wash clothes and repack before we have to leave to go on the cruise. Oh and didn't I mention the first vacation is overseas so it takes a bit more planning than a US vacation. We leave in a few days for that vacation. I'm also still working 45 plus hours a week up until the day we leave so I don't have a lot of time to devote to the cruise. I've made that clear to everyone going on a cruise. Since we're a bit less than a month from the cruise, we can check in and I'm trying to coordinate that with everyone and having a tough time doing that. Texts go unanswered. I am to the point I simply don't care any longer. I checked my significant other and I in and that's it. I have spent a week trying to coordinate times since we're supposed to carpool there but I'm done trying to get people to answer my freaking texts. And here is where you guys that have read this far are looking for. The juicy stuff. The drama stuff. Back when we planned this cruise everyone told me they had a passport. I thought that was the end of it. I didn't think I needed to investigate further into that. Unfortunately I should have. So I explained to one how to check in online and mentioned having your passport handy so you can enter that information. The person then takes that moment to inform me that their passport is expired. They also have no clue where their birth certificate is. At this point, said person may not be getting on a cruise. Luckily for them, they live in a state they were born in and the state capital is just a few hours from their home. So I sent him a link to set up an appointment in person to get their birth certificate. I have not followed up with them to find out if they made the appointment or found their birth certificate. I'm officially done for this year trying to corral everything. I have gone above and beyond for a freaking year now and I have no fricks left to give. Who wants to take bits on if the one with the expired passport gets on a ship? Update number 6. Last I left you guys, my significant other and I were gearing up for an overseas trip, coming home and then almost immediately going on this family cruise. Well, we are back from both, so now it's time for the update. Our trip overseas was amazing. 
We got to spend time at a hotel that has amazing views of Mount Fuji. And we stayed at a Yukon with our own private hot spring. Absolutely amazing and picture perfect that we will be going back. We got home, I had about enough time to wash clothes and repack before we got on the boat. So all of us live in the same state, some closer than others. The ones that live about 10 hours away started that Tuesday and spent the night in my town so we could carpool to the cruise terminal. The ones that live about 5 hours away decided to drive down the day off. They headed at about 4 a.m. Thanksgiving Day and met us at a place open Thanksgiving Day. And that's when they dropped the bomb on us. One of the persons in their party did not remember to pack their passport and they didn't have their birth certificate. Yes, it's the same group that I mentioned before whose passport was expired. Same group, different person. That person miraculously found their birth certificate so they were golden. We drive down to the cruise terminal, help everyone with their luggage and boy, was there a lot of luggage. And one went to ask about the whole passport situation. He came back to let us know that the person that forgot their passport absolutely would not be allowed on the cruise. Said person had every opportunity to upload their passport ahead of time and had they done that, they would have been allowed to sail. But nope, said person did not do it. So we watched two from our group board the bus back to the parking lot to retrieve their vehicle and head home. No timber tantrums, no blaming me, at least not yet. They are trying to get future cruise credits for their missed cruise, but it's not looking good. The rest of us got on the ship and that's where the fun began. All of us had been on cruises before so we knew what to expect, but nothing prepared us for this trip. This was a 5 day cruise on a small older ship that wasn't laid out very well, especially in a post-covid world. People had no concept of personal space anywhere, not on the elevators. Not in line for the buffet, not in line for coffee, not sitting at a table. They also had no concept of cleaning up after themselves or even flushing a freaking toilet. Plates of half-eaten food in the stairwells next to the art pieces, half-drunk drinks all over the railings, dirty tissues in the elevators. People, adults and kids, not covering their mouths when they sneeze or cough. Had a kid that looked to be about seven coughed directly on my arm. And the mother did not apologize or even say anything to her heathen. Watched the lady smack the absolute crap out of another lady right by the service desk and they did nothing. For a moment I thought we were at Walmart. This was not the experience any of us has had on past cruises, so it was a total surprise to us. And on to only a bit of family drama that actually made it on a ship. The one cousin that planned to bring edibles did apparently bring them and decided to eat one or two gummies and also literally drink all night long and into the morning of embarkation while not sleeping the last night we were on a ship. Made for a not pleasant embarkation trying to track his A down to get out of the ship. And I'm already planning the next family cruise. Hopefully people will be more prepared for the next cruise. Update number 7. So I want to clear a few things up since my posts make it to update group and people there have questions. Yes, I address my followers because surprisingly I have 529 followers as of right now and as long as people want to know, I don't mind letting you guys see a glimpse into my life. Yep, I'm just a shock to some of you that people are following my crazy family. Y'all really should let me tell you about the other side of the family. That one's got murders and all. It's definitely a lot more interesting than this side of the family. Now on to money questions. My significant other and I don't have kids. I were a bit older, so we have a lot of disposable income. When I cry about paying for others, it's because those people feel entitled to my and others' money. Those people have always been like that, and I don't play into their games. They are not rich, and I always take bets into concentration before booking any family vacation, but they truly feel they are entitled to go and not pay. It's not a question of being too poor to go, and everything to do is making poor financial decisions, and expecting others to pay for their vacation. When we did the cabin, I was perfectly okay with paying a larger share of the food with the ones that didn't pay anything contributed in other ways, like cooking or cleaning, but they didn't. They either sat on their rear end complaining they needed money tree or drank themselves drunk the entire time. When I would say, hey, I need you to make this, and literally hand them everything they needed to make it, they would feign ignorance 
and then proceeded to purposely screw up the food I gave them in hopes of getting out of future things. I don't play those games. That's why we decided to cruise for Thanksgiving. That way everyone paid their fair share. The two people who aren't as flush with money were asked before I booked if they could afford it. They both said yes. They were given 9 months to come up with less than $500 apiece. Well, no, that's incorrect. They had 9 months to come up with $125 altogether. One conveniently left out that they have booked a cruise for after our cabin family vacation. Yes, the same vacations the person said they couldn't afford to help pay for. They paid $1,200 for the cruise and then couldn't go, so they had a credit with a cruise line that covered two people's cruise minus taxes and port fees. That $125 figure. Yes, there is a discrepancy in how much was paid and what they owed. You apparently can't use future cruise credit for port fees and taxes. They did struggle to come up with $125, but again, it was because of poor financial choices. They aren't required to come, and I do talk to them before booking anything to make sure they can afford it. I don't just assume they can and book it. I ask, I go over the details, and once I get a yes, then I proceed. Also because some people didn't know this, cruises can be cheap. We booked inside cabins, and for two people, for five days, it was $500 per person. So about $100 a day. That includes meals. There were some questions about my private vacations that don't include my family. We book years in advance. Years 2024 and 2025 are already booked. And if my significant other would let me, I'd have booked 2026 too. There were five days between when we landed back home and when we had to be on a cruise ship. In that time frame, my significant other and I still had to work three of those days. I also work 9 to 10 hours days and have about a 3 hour round trip commute each day. That's what I meant when I said we only had about enough time to wash clothes and repack. We are able to get decent deals on our vacations because we book far in advance. Japan cost us about 10 grand altogether for 2 weeks, including airfare. We started in Tokyo and made our way across the country. We went to Kyoto, Takayama, but we got to see Mount Fuji. Hiroshima, and just so many awesome things. For that, we hired an excellent travel agent who got us great deals on hotels, attractions, and tour guides. Now, on to the sort of update. One person told me that financially, they are struggling and couldn't afford a family vacation, and I believe them. So I suggested we go up to where they live this year. That saves them from hotel rooms and gas, and then they only have to come up with activities and meals. They agreed said that was an excellent idea, and I then spoke to the others and they flatly refused the idea. They want a cruise. Cruise doesn't work for two of the people, and I told them that. The response is that two poorest people shouldn't dictate the rest. I disagree. I have no issue working around people's finances so that we can include everyone. So we're at an impasse. I gave everyone till January 15th to figure out what we were doing and that deadline came and went with no communication. So I booked a second vacation for my significant other and I for Christmas. We've now used up all of our vacation time and I have nothing left over for the family vacation. In the last two weeks, the one that flatly refused anything but a cruise is trying to figure out something. They have suggested going to Vegas or Louisiana or Biloxi. I've said each time that they need to speak to the one who told me they couldn't afford it and see what they say first. I'm not helping or planning anything, so that's where we stand now. It doesn't look promising for a family vacation this year at all. But if it miraculously happens, I will gladly update you guys. If you want an update.